Tonight on Nation to Nation, experimented on as children, we speak with an Inuk man seeking justice. Fayak booted. Our MPs panel weighs in on the ousting of residential school apologist Senator Lynn Bayak. And Senate behind bars, Senator Kim Pate wants the Senate committee to hold hearings inside a federal prison. I'm Jorge Barrera. This is Nation to Nation. Zibidi Nungak, Peter Itinuar, and Eric Taguna were taken as children by the federal government for an experiment to find out if these Inuit children were as smart as white children. Now, these three men want justice from the Justin Trudeau government for what was done to them. Joining me now is Peter Itinuar. Thanks for joining us, Peter. I'm glad to be here. So I guess as to begin, I was wondering if you could tell us, you know, what your life was like as a child before the government took you on this experiment. Uh, like many other Inuit kids or Eskimo kids uh, in those days, uh, we were growing up learning how to uh, uh, run dog teams and learning how to hunt and uh, going to school uh, during the winter time. And, uh, but uh, being a lot out on the land and uh, fishing, hunting, trapping, those sorts of activities were uh, very normal for uh, most Inuit kids in those days. Uh, life was transitioning from uh, igloos to uh, houses and uh, uh, we were becoming newly minted uh, Canadians by virtue of the fact that uh, uh, the Canadian government had repealed parts of the Dominion Act in 1960 and which enabled our people to uh, participate in electoral processes so we were very newly minted Canadian but very, still very much attached to our past. It must have been quite the contrast to you know be suddenly moved to you know, an urban setting with its pavement and sidewalks and controlled, you know, nature in a lot of ways? Well, we had, uh, we had looked forward to it uh, because we, were, we knew about it uh, beforehand, although our parents were never asked for consent and all that. Uh, it was, uh, the contrast might not even be, uh, a, uh, might not be a word that really covers what we felt when we got there. It was a shock. Uh, and in those days, in 1962, most uh, public schools did not have any students other than uh, either WASP or, or you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, Catholic, what have you kind of uh, people. Uh, there, there were no Asians, there were, uh, uh, there were no black people, there were no uh, Middle Eastern people. Uh, so we were it. We were the uh, off-color uh, uh, kids who came into the school, but uh, for the most part, we were welcomed by most of the students. So you never f really faced any overt racism? Um, well, when you're a kid, I think uh, you experience that anyway. I mean, yeah, there were a few fights, uh, there were, uh, but uh, for the most part, we participated in sports and so on. We adapted quite quickly, as kids will. Uh, it was scary, extremely scary. I had to be literally pushed into a classroom uh, when we first got to the school. Uh, but uh, but uh, the shock wore off in a few days and we, we, we adapted pretty well, which I think was part of our job. And, and that's interesting, you know, part of your job. I mean, you were, you were part of an experiment and you didn't really know about it. And, and something that struck me when I was reading your story that was uh, published online on APTN, that you didn't even know you were part of an experiment until 1997. Can you tell us about that? that? Well, that's, that's right. Uh, we knew that uh, uh, the government was trying to figure out uh, what kind of policy to form about educating Inuit kids, uh, whether to take them down south, whether to uh, build schools up north. And, and in fact, the experiment was about whether we could uh, even c uh, compete with uh, normal kids as they, they were known as and, and in a, in a uh, middle class uh, setting in a public school and that was what the experiment was about. We, did, we were not told that. We were told simply that we would be going to Ottawa to go to school. And then in, uh, in, the, in the 90s, a fellow named David King, who is a professor at Trent University now, uncovered uh, some, uh, through archival research on genocide in Canada, 
the paper, uh, the document that uh, described our situation as, a, as an experiment in uh, social engineering. And so uh, it was to determine whether, uh, help determine uh, whether uh, the government would start building schools in the north or whether they would take Inuit kids into the south. And, and, and I, the three of us uh, decided to uh, take some action and see where it would go. Now you've been you've been trying since 2008. I think that's when you you filed your first statement of claim. You've been trying to get compensation for some time from the yeah. federal government for what they what they did uh, the manipulation. I mean, you had no no idea what was happening. Your parents didn't know. Now you know that started under previous government. Now we have a you know the the liberal government under uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who you met both when you were a child uh, when he was a child. As well, and mm -hmm. also, you know, recently, about four years ago, what do you want to say to um, Prime Minister Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, about, you know, what's owed, the justice that you're seeking? Well, simply this: uh, I think Zebedee and Eric and I would like to be compensated for the work we did. We did a job; they never really paid us for it. I mean, we got thirty dollars a month for our expenses, <laughs> uh, but uh, we wanted. Uh, we thought, well, you know. We'll sign a release. We'll extinguish any uh, uh, any further claims in the future. Uh, they had the Harper government had uh, uh, fought us back with a statute of limitations argument that uh, didn't really wash with us because we didn't know that we were an experiment until 1997. What I'd like to say to uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, the new Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, is that uh, look, uh, let's settle this uh, like with good will and good faith and, uh, uh, and uh, come to an agreement and, and we'll sign any releases you want us to sign. We don't need an apology. Uh, we just, uh, we'll, just, we'll be happy to be compensated for a job uh, that was rather well done in my opinion and, uh, and uh, we'll leave it at that. So I, I thank you so much for, for speaking with us. Well, thank you so much for uh, having me, and I wish Eric and uh, uh, Zebedee had been here with me, but uh, in this age of truth and reconciliation uh, world that we live in now, we hope that there can be some kind of reconciliation here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. When we return, residential school apologist Lynn Bea gets booted, and 150 years of colonialism. The MP panel weighs in. I'm Jorge Barrera, Nation to Nation. We'll be right back. I'm Jorge Barrera. This is Nation to Nation. Lots of sparks this week after Senator Lynn Bayak was booted from the Senate Aboriginal People's Committee and Justice Minister Jody Wilson Raybould's South Africa speech about Canada's 150 years of colonialism left some people feeling uncomfortable. Joining me now is Parliamentary Secretary for Indigenous Affairs, Yvonne Jones, Conservative MP Arnold Beerson, and PMP or Rachel Blaney. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Thank you. Good morning. Right. So we're going to start with, uh, speaking of this morning, uh, with uh, Senator uh, Bayak, um, Lynn Bayak. As you know, there's been long-running controversy over her statements about Indian residential schools. And uh, Arnold, your leader yesterday said that she had asked uh, Senator Bayak to Apart from the uh, Indigenous Affairs Committee, the Senate Committee, um, I'm just wondering, how, what's your take on Senator Bayak? Was it a good move to get her off that committee? Well, for sure. Like the the statements that she's made has been like triggering within First Nations communities. The the, the amount of grief and, and sorrow that has come from the residential schools, uh, it has been Im immense, right? And so what. I, we're most importantly want to judge actions. That's the main thing. And she she talked about uh, intentions and things like that. We we cannot judge intentions. Uh, it, it's impossible to tell what the intentions were beforehand. So we're going to judge the actions. And, and the vast majority of the actions that take took place at the residential schools ha had been horrific, and, and many people had been very much um, yeah damaged by by the actions that took place at residential school. And so we're going to continue to focus on the actions and and continue to work on. Going down the road to reconciliation—that that is everybody's everybody's goal, including the Conservative Party's goal, for sure. Yvonne, what what do you think that Senator Bayak's comments 
created cause any damage? Like, what are you hearing from your community? Her, right her comments were very hurtful to many Canadians, um, many Indigenous Canadians who suffered uh, in the systematic approach to schooling under residential school system. Um, many people were scarred for life, uh, scars that have been passed on and are generational. So I think for most Canadians, they probably looked at her and said, how does a person get to sit in the Senate with such ideology about Indigenous people when we've turned such a substantial corner towards reconciliation in this country? And that's certainly how I feel. Removing her from the committee is one thing, and I certainly applaud the leader of the opposition of the Conservative uh, Party for making that demand. Uh, however, personally, I believe she should be removed from the Senate. I, as an Indigenous person in this country, have tremendous um, uh, problems with the fact that they, there are people in the Senate that have the ideology that she has. And I don't think it's room for it. While we are a diverse country, we are also a country that is on a road to reconciliation with our first people. And in order for that to work, the levels of governance has to be supportive of it. And if the people that hold those levels of governance are not supportive, we're not going to make the progress that all of us as Canadians are hoping to make. Rachel, you, the NDP isn't really hot on the Senate to begin with, but in terms of removing her outright, uh, just wondering what, what, you, what, your, what your take is on that. Well, absolutely, we want to see her removed from the Senate. Um, the statements that she has made and how hard she has clung to those statements has been mm -hmm. shameful. Uh, the reality is there was a system put in place to annihilate Indigenous people and to specifically take the Indian out of the child. And when you look at that system, it cannot be about, you know, her perspective of if there were nice people or not. The system itself was dysfunctional. The system itself has had huge impacts on communities, and those realities are still here today. I think many Canadians are still learning that the last residential school was closed in 1996. Mm -hmm. You know, these are current issues. The impacts have been profound. And when you have a position of power like the senator does, and you say the things that she has said, it totally takes away people's voice again. And if we are a country on a path to reconciliation, silencing those voices should never be something that anyone in a position of power has the ability to do. Okay, well, let's, let's switch to um, a speech that's uh, uh, Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould gave in South Africa uh, recently over the last weekend. Um, there's been some reaction to what she said. Arnold, I'm going to begin with you. I mean, she, she talked about the difficulty that Indigenous people um, feel in terms of celebrating Canada's 150th birthday. She said 150 years of colonialism. Now, Conservative candidate Lisa Raid on Twitter called the comments shameful. I'm just wondering what, what you make of, you know, talking about Canada's 150th anniversary as also being 150 years of colonialism. Yeah, so I, like I struggle with that comment for sure. Like it, the, I think that uh, our indigenous communities have contributed to the history of Canada for 150 years and actually beyond that. Uh, I know that the War of 1812 that our, our indigenous communities fought alongside the British soldiers uh, to defeat the Americans in, in that in that war, and so we we celebrate that. I know in Alberta right now, I just shared a, a news article on my uh, on my Facebook page about a, a sniper from the First World War who was a, a First Nations uh, fellow, was a very good marksman, uh, and and highly celebrated. And so uh, these these things that. In the, and he fought in the Battle of Vimy Ridge, which is, I, I, we, we consider that to be the battle that defined Canada, uh, which brought Canada as a nation to the, to the world stage. And so to have those people fighting side by side with our, with our armed forces, fighting side by side with the British and the French in the War of 1812, uh, those are rich parts of our history. And, and to say that the First Nations weren't part of them uh, or, or that we've just ignored that, uh, I, I, th I don't think it's, it's fair. I think that the First Nations have built this nation as much as anybody else. Yes, we've made mistakes. Residential schools has been terrible. Um, I, I, would, I would say that that's been a, a failure to, to recognize uh, parental rights for, for sure, right? If, if, we, if we recognize the, the basic family unit, we would never, we'd never broken up basic family units and sent people off to residential schools. 
those are all mistakes of the past. We could talk about other mistakes. The the Japanese. Rachel, Rachel keeps yeah. shaking her, her head every <laughs> yeah. time. But what what is but, it that? But we sent uh, you know what? Japanese we have to, to look at the the reality of the, the history of right? this country, these are, those are which is people were fighting for Canada, but they weren't allowed to vote in their own country. So when you look at the systemic discrimination, the racism, it's not just about residential schools. It is so much broader than that. It's about a group of people that have continuously had legislation put up against them so that they could not be successful. And here we are today. You know, and I appreciate uh, the minister talking about this reality. And I've heard from Indigenous communities across my writing, what am I celebrating? 150 years of oppression? Um, and I think that that's something that we need to be listening to because those are the people who get to tell us what their experience is. We don't get to tell them. And and I will also add this, um, you know, I'm really grateful that the minister talked about that. What I would like to see happening in Canada is a real recognition of the fact that we still have Indigenous communities living in third world uh, resources. They are struggling in profound ways. We still are seeing a lot of programs with the 2% cap. So, you know, and we also are seeing a lot of Indigenous children still in our court system. And this government has the ability to stop that. So if we're going to be taking the next step, I hope that the minister is taking that message to her government. Okay. Yvonne, 150 years of colonialism? Well, first of all, I want to say that Minister Wilson Rabel is not just a minister in the cabinet. She's one of the strongest Indigenous women in Canada today who has worked her entire life towards self resilience and rights for Indigenous people. Her statements are, are directly meant in terms of how she feels in terms of the culture that she has been a part of, in terms of her identity as a Canadian. And moving forward together is going to take strong leadership like that of Minister Wilson Rabel. And it's going to take many other Canadians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to make the next 150 years not about colonialism, but about celebrating the real diversity and the real individuality of Canadians and ensure that we all move forward together. Thank you so much for joining us this week and uh, we'll reconvene again and, and you know we'll keep hashing this one out. Thank, so thank you for coming. Thank you. Senator Kim Pate will be with me right after the break talking about prisoners' rights. Nation to Nation, we'll be right back. Hey Pereira, this is Nation to Nation. Before she was appointed a senator, Kim Pate was a tireless advocate for women in prison. Now she wants the Senate's Human Rights Committee to hold hearings behind bars on human rights issues facing federal prisoners. Joining me now is Senator Kim Pate. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Thank you. So uh, with the Senate Human Rights Committee, you are involved in a, a new study. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that you guys are looking at? It's human rights in prisons, in federal prisons. And so um, this, this was an idea of Senator Jim Munson before, in actually some meetings that I think you may have been at. I was at um, earlier last year. And uh, a number of people suggested that the Senate should look at what's happening inside the prisons not just some of the issues around. They were actually at a, it was an open caucus meeting about mental health. Mm -hmm. And Senator Munson said, well, maybe we should look at prisons. And everybody cheered. And so um, by the time I got to the Senate, that was uh, an idea that was already sort of in, in, uh, in the thought process. And it started to germinate. And so I'm very pleased to be on the Human Rights Committee. And we're, uh, we've already launched. Yesterday, we heard from some more people who have been in prison, as well as the parole board and uh, we'll be continuing those meetings and into May where uh, the plan is that we'll be going to as, as far as I know from the steering committee and the Senator Toulajan who's also the vice chair and Senator Munson that's where the plan is to go to some of the prisons uh, to hold some public meetings in those areas and hopefully to hold some meetings in the prisons themselves. In the prisons themselves? That's right. With inmates who are or yeah. prisoners who are that's and right. So what is it exactly that you hope a meeting like that will show the senators on the Human Rights Committee? Well, I think, um, as Louise Arbour said last year at our conference, there are people who are sentencing individuals to prison and, I would say, lawmakers who are making 
uh, decisions about laws that could end up with more people going to prison, as we've seen over the last couple of decades, both in the House of Commons and the Senate. Numerous bills passed that resulted in longer sentences, more punitive sentences. And if they don't know, if people are making decisions like that and they actually don't know where people are going and the conditions to which they'll be subjected, then shame on them. And so um, part of the idea is to ensure that senators have an idea of where people are going, what's happening, and that they hear directly from those in prison, both uh, those who are imprisoned. And there are many staff who, as you know, over the years who have talked to many of us about the conditions and the problems they have and the, um, the challenges of seeing huge numbers, increasing numbers of Indigenous people, but in particular Indigenous women coming into prison, increased numbers of people with mental health issues. And so what better way to see that than actually go to a prison, meet with people, see the conditions of confinement, and even though they'll be cleaned up and all of that, uh, I think it's you're hard pressed walking into a prison and meeting with people not to get a sense of some of those issues. Unlike probably a lot of your colleagues, you know about life inside prisons in your in your previous role as the head of the Elizabeth Fry Society uh, of Canada, Associations of Canada. Um, what is it that you hope that your colleagues on, on the Human Rights Committee will see or learn mm -hmm. based on your own experience behind yeah. the well, liar. Well, thank you for that vote of confidence. I've never, been, I've never been imprisoned, and so I don't presume to know what that's like. I certainly have had the privilege and responsibility of walking with many, many people over 35 years, young people, men and women, who've, who have, are in prison or have been in prison. And what I've seen is the devastation of you know, for indigenous peoples, you know, generations of colonization, the, the, you know, what's been well articulated by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and many others, what's been well articulated by Cindy Blackstock and the Caring Society and, um, and all the um, Aboriginal uh, First Nations groups, national, local, uh, regional, is, you know, the, the genocidal impact of the, what's happened in terms of how Indigenous peoples have been treated in this country has led to huge overrepresentation. When you have a group of people who are three to four percent of the population and are about 25 percent of the men's population, 37 percent of the, the population of women in prison, 43 percent of girls mm -hmm. in custody, you see there's a, there's a massive problem. And so um, I think you can't, you can't quite imagine what that's like until you walk into a prison, um, say in the prairies, and all you see is Indigenous faces. And you know that's not who's posing the greatest risk to public safety. But you also have your own thoughts about, you know, the, 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 the system of punishment that we have. I mean, mm -hmm. your, your views in terms of what, how Corrections Canada deals with it, you think that there, there needs to be some major change in terms of how we punish. Can, can you give us a sense of what, how you think the system should operate? How should sure. someone who's been convicted be treated? Mm -hmm. Is, is put them, putting them in, in cells with bunk beds with, you know, you know, monitoring and concertina wire, is that, is that the best way? Absolutely to? not. I mean, all of, all of the research, Corrections Own research worldwide shows that the best way um, to assist people to not end up in the situations they are is actually improve conditions of living in their communities first and foremost. Um, so one of the things we need to do is try and figure out how do we prevent more people from going to prison. That's some of what we may look at in the Human Rights Committee. It's hard to know what the committee as a whole will decide in terms of recommendations. It's also part of the reason in other contexts, I'm you know, working with other senators around things like guaranteed livable income, getting rid of the assault provisions that, that allow Section 43 of the Code that allow us to assault children but not adults. Um, and, but in the prison system itself, there are currently mechanisms that would allow us to get people out of the system, particular Indigenous prisoners, um, that are not being used. Or the law, the law is permissive in the, in, in the sense that the law allows all kinds of creativity, mm -hmm. but the policy that Corrections has put in place is so narrow that very few people get access to it. Okay, well thank you so much for coming in to talk about this and hopefully we can reconnect. Will do, thank you. come back again. Yes, thank right. you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for all the work you're doing and please call me Kim. That's all the time we have for Nation to Nation this week. But come back and join us again next week. I'm Jorge Barrera. Good night. <laughs>